Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Fantastic to see the group coming in today. Thank you for taking the time to join us. All right, so my name is Laurel Ramirez. I'm the head of school here at UWC Thailand, and it's a real honor and pleasure to have you all with us here today. As we consider whether or not students can lead successful service projects, we've got an amazing group of students on the call with us today, and I know that they are going to leave you with no doubt whatsoever that they absolutely can lead successful service projects, but I think we'll also be learning a lot about how they might be able to go about that. So as our communications team in the background continues to let our our attendees in. We're going to go ahead and get started with talking about a little bit how the webinar is going to run today. Thank you, Colin. So we're going to be having a discussion uh, with our students led by our fantastic service coordinator, uh, Crew Heidi, where we're going to be talking about some of the mission-driven alignment that we seek in service projects here at UWC Thailand. There's going to be a quick overview that Crew Heidi is going to go through to look at what's already happening at UWC Thailand on a service front and the future of service learning for us, as is always the case at most schools, even though we do fantastic things, we also are always looking for how we might be able to do better. So you are uh, fortunate today to be able to hear some ideas from Ku Heidi and students about what they would like to do moving forward. Some reminders and encouragement for you on your participation during the webinar. Please keep your microphone on mute so that we're able to hear all of our participants as they share. If you haven't done so already, please rename yourself in the chat. And while I'm giving you this welcome, go ahead and throw into the chat where you're joining us from. That would be amazing so that we can see who we have here on the call with us. Consider keeping your video on throughout the webinar so that we can build a bit of community. If that's comfortable for you, we would appreciate it. And any questions that you might have as we go along, feel free to pop those into the chat. We'll be making sure to leave space at the end of the webinar today in order to answer participant questions from anyone who's joining us. If you are hearing something you really love and you want to show your reaction in the moment, feel free to use those interactive emojis that are available here on Zoom. And during the question and answer session, go ahead and raise your virtual hand if you'd like to engage with the Q&A through your microphone. All right, without further ado, we're gonna jump straight into the content. So introducing to you our Director of Service Learning uh, and CAS here at UWC Thailand, Crew Heidi. Thank you so much, Crew Heidi. I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thank you so much, uh, Laurel. I'm really proud to be presenting today and we're joined by some fabulous grade 11 and 12s who come from a wide range of countries, cultures. They're really diverse in their outlook and they're very diverse in their outcomes. Um, I'm going to run through what we're going to do at UWC. I'm going to keep it brief because I know that you want to hear from the students. You don't want to hear from, from me. Um, we do have, um, I think, 12 students who will be um, hopefully partake, partaking in uh, conversations today. And we do have bios for you um, so you can understand a little bit more about the students. Um, those bios I'm not going to go through right now. So, Colin, if you could just scroll through those. So Jay, Brian, Jay, yep, so Gio, Amar, Iman, Gacto, Joseph, Richard, yep, so we've got 12 there. Um, as I said before, really diverse in outcome and outlook, and really appreciate you just taking some time outside of this um, webinar today to, to get to know them. Um, so, service at UWC, well, it is really important embedded and it's part of the heart of who we are as an educational model. We're really committed to service. And as I said, it's embedded in our learning philosophy and our teaching mission. Um, we embrace it in every single um, possible manner that we can. We aim to challenge our students, inspire them, to act for the good for all and to you know, consider sustainable and development actions um, for, for the planet. Um, we've got a strong, strong sense of vision, and it really aligns with our projects. Um, everything that we do at UWC, I'd like to think, goes back and is embedded back into that vision and values of who we believe we are. And um, by having such a strong vision base, it really makes our, our success very plausible. It enables us to work step by step to make things more achievable. So if we can go to, to the next step. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in brief, um, 
We have um, a very strong foundation of projects here where we um, are able to develop empathy, compassion, and very specific skill sets that are required to support our students, um, whether it be with time or whether we support them with a budget, we can make things really happen here at UWC. COVID aside, um, you know, we are able to really connect with our, our partners on a regular basis. And that's because, you know, we have a strong, strong budget line that actually supports us. Our projects are scaffolded. Um, the concepts are developed and they are uh, revisited in multiple grade levels. So, for example, um, our grade twos, our grade fives, our grade eights will work with the same service partners. So they can actually see the impact and they can see the development of um, the programs that um, they have been heavily involved in. Um, I talked a lot about the, the mission and values, even our service um, aspects as far as our co-curricular programs are concerned are still modeled within our, our values. So everything comes back to who we believe UWC is and who do we want our UWC students to be. Um, our projects are generally within 30 minutes of UWC Thailand, which enables us to maximize our interaction and, and involvement. Um, we wanna spend more time doing and less time traveling. Um, so, you know, that's a, a big consideration for us. And our projects really concentrate on the social and the environmental um, aspects within within uh, Phuket itself. If we go on to the next slide, thank you. Um, everybody who's familiar with, with the IB will know the sort of the continuum and we are fortunate to be a, an IB continuum school from primary through to the middle years and um, developing it into our CAS program. So everything is built on from year to year to year. And we are very, very um, aware of the aims and objectives of each of those programs. And we're giving our students, as I said before, the foundations of skills and knowledge to really feel individual success and ownership and agency from grade to grade. Um, so that when they get to grade 11 and 12, they can do some amazing things. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of some of our student led programs and you'll be able to see how they are linked to the uh, vision and values. So next slide, please. Um, I will share the link to the Padlet for anybody who's interested in more depth, but uh, you'll be able to see a range of CCAs, co-curricular activities that um, are embedded in our, our general mission statement, whether it be peace or sustainability, um, community. Um, so yeah, every every um, aspect of our, our mission, we can very much give you solid examples of how we're embracing it. So what does success look like? You know, that, that's a big, big question. And today's concept is, you know, can students run um, successful programs? So if we go on to the next slide. Um, you know, we, we've got to break it down. We've got to think about, you know, success for our students, success for our partners and really success for, for the community. Um, so, we, you know, we do want our students to be resilient and, and to persevere. And it's a case of giving them appropriate challenges to be able to, to develop that. Um, our students will make mistakes. You know, none of them are perfect. And we will pick them up when they fall down. We we'll encourage them when you know things are getting really tough. But you know it's important for them to really understand that it's okay to make mistakes and things aren't aren't perfect. And I'm sure that some of our grade eleven and twelves will um, really highlight some of the monumentous uh, disasters that they've had. Um, but you know we we've. we've got to fall down many, many times before we pick ourselves up to get to the top of that mountain and, and to really sort of demonstrate some of the, the real powerful impacts that they have. Um, you know, for our partners, you know, success for me is that willingness for long-term commitment. And I think we're really fortunate that um, even over the period of COVID that many of our partners have maintained that trust um, and connection with us. Um, that we've been able to work with them for, for several years now. And we're still a young school. So, you know, when a, when a partner's happy to commit and participate and have reciprocal learning um, over the last six years, you know, I see that as a real personal success for the school. Um, you know, what does it look like? You know, that, that looks like um, regular 
uh, visits to um, our partner programs. It gives them opportunity for say reciprocal and mutual support. You know, I'd like to think that our students are getting as much out of their involvement as the organizations that we are participating in. And, you know, we have to be aware that we've we've done some great stuff and we've been recognized for it. You know, last year we got the Aircost Humanitarian Award. Um, we've been um, featured for the Young Aurora um, um, Award. Um, we've had winners for the Go Make a Difference Award. These are very much UWC and international awards, but you know, nonetheless, phenomenal achievements. And all of these awards are very much written by our students. They submit proposals and they do all the groundwork and the delivery of the proposal. Um, so that success is really all theirs. And you know, as a school, we've been shortlisted for the Environmental Initiative um, Award. Um, the future, as I say, I'm going to go through this really quickly. So what does our future look like? Well, you know, it's really exciting times ahead. Um, last year, we did um, what was called documentaries, where our grade sixes were doing an interdisciplinary unit. It started off with two subjects. It ended up being five subjects. I think this year we've got six subjects joining us. So really developing those interdisciplinary units and really allows our students to have that service connection. Um, whereby they're able to um, demonstrate support and agency. Um, we're going to work on better language acquisition uh, through our Thai, langu uh, Thai language and cultural course. Um, you know, many of our students are, aren't fluid, fluent Thai speakers. Um, so it's, again, important that we're able to understand and have some language um, knowledge to be able to interact at a higher level within our community. And then we're also having a look at some vision aligned um, learning through micro credentials and some exciting potential courses for the future for our middle school years. And that's not being said that, you know, a lot of these concepts are also delivered in the primary school and further developed in the fabulous work our, our secondary, sorry, our, our seniors do in grade 11 and 12. So the big question. Um, you know, what does success look like? Well, let's go to, to our students, because as I said before, I want you to hear from, from them. Um, as you can see, they're, again, involved in a whole variety of, of programs. And um, I think if I had to start off with the, the first question, and feel free, please put other student-based questions in, in the chat, because um, I'd love for you to get to know them and get to hear from them. So let's, let's go straight into, can students lead a successful program? So if we go to our student panel, um, if I can go to some of the grade 12s, um, you've been here a little longer, so you've been involved in programs a little longer. So maybe um, let's think, uh, Annika, Diego, Jay Bryan, would you like to give us a little, little synopsis there can students lead a successful program uh yep hello so my name is jay brian i am from italy and indonesia and i lead shaka cafe which is our student-led cafe here in uwc thailand so what i think success looks like is is very different from shaka with shaka so in terms of shaka so we we open during breaks and lunch times and we like serve drinks and and food items to our community and our society. And you obviously most likely the MYPs and the DPs. And I think success for us is just seeing the appreciation for this in our community. So when someone will come back and saying, oh, you made a delicious cup of coffee or something like that, like that's, that just brings, you know, a lot of joy to us, you know, the members of Shaka. And I think that's, that's one, one like great, thing that I think about when running a program like Shaka. Um, so Diego, I'm Annika from Sri Lanka. And I'm Diego from the Philippines. Uh, we organized the 24 hour race for UWC this year. So success for us, overall success was having the event and running it and completing the race. However, on our journey to planning the race, we had small successful moments where we completed a task, say designing merch collecting the merchants, being proud of ourselves and what we did. So success was, it was building up to the event at the time. And I feel we didn't get there 
it wasn't successful and it wasn't easy to get there. There were so many setbacks throughout, especially because of COVID and just time restrictions because compared to other races around the world, we did it in a much shorter time frame with much fewer people. However, in the end, we managed to have the race and had a very successful race and raised over 20,000 baht in total, which is 200. quite 200,000 baht in total. <laughs> quite a lot of money I would say for the time frame we had and success for us there were small moments of success and then the bigger moments of success but it just varied throughout the time yeah I think even though the 24-hour race was an event so it's a bit different from Shaka the success also is similar when you see all of the hard work that you put into these projects and you get to see what comes out of it and you see that everybody's attending and the race is going as smooth as we not as smooth as we planned but as smooth as can be on the race day because the event itself is 24 hours so our team needed to be alert for those 24 hours but mm -hmm. moreover like leading to what Annika says I think success is seeing the support of the people like the support of the people in the event and the money that was coming in to help fund the event and the money that was coming in to fundraise for the event I think those were like the more tangible things that we could like attach the success to, especially because the 24 hour race is using the money that we raised here and the money that's being raised in all other 24 hour race says to build a center for child trafficking victims here in Thailand. And I think that the success there is also because it's the first official one here at UWC Thailand is setting the foundation for future races and for future student initiated events to be as successful, if not more. Yeah, thank you, Diego. Um, you just talked about you know, a very local project and a very international project and setting down foundations. So my next question, I guess, would be, you know, what are the steps for success? Um, like Gio, you've been here for, for several years now and you've been part of different programs, whereas Iman and Kim Young, you're fresh faces here at UWC. So. What are the steps? How have you been successful? What what was your journey like? Um, so my name is Gio from South Korea and I lead Mindfulness Arts Program um, for past 18 months. And so in UWC, I believe that the very first and the hardest step for steps for success is like really getting out of your comfort zone and facing like new challenges and really take on it with responsibility, which we actually practice during our MYP years since grade seven until grade 10. And when we get to our DP program, we actually get to really lead our own programs to like to the point where it's actually quite successful. Um, and I guess as we achieve our goals throughout the years, um, we as an individual grow and get more confidence about our, our, about our abilities and get more confident about taking more challenges in the future. Gio, and uh, let me speak on behalf of your students to the fact that over the last 18 months, you have led a very, very enriching program and um, for, for everybody's knowledge that was the primary school program so the challenges that our students often face are not just working with their peers in their own grade levels you know geo's taken on that the extra initiative to work with with the younger students down in primary um so that was in the latter part of the day as part of the cca program um kim young and iman what have your successes or your steps to success been like what you had to do um, hello, my name is Kim Young. I'm from Thailand. I lead um, Sexuality and Gender Alliance. So for me, I think, first of all, like, you have to get out of your comfort zone because personally, before I came to UWC, I don't have much knowledge on sexuality and gender because I came from a very conservative um, culture. So... I don't know much detail about it, but after I moved to um, UWC, I learned a lot about this. And so me and my friend who is also in LGBTQ community, we discuss and brainstorm what we see the issue in the school and what we want to address. So I think that 
the step for success um is to get out of your comfort zone and never give up because I know like it can be challenging sometimes to to reach your goal but you just have to be patient thank you Kim Young anybody else want to talk about the the steps for success Ayman is that your hand up yeah should I go for it? yeah let's get it. Uh, hello everyone my, my name is Ayman and I'm Moroccan uh, I'm leading the UWC Thailand uh, volunteering team for the Gibbon Rehabilitation Program. Uh, what are the Gibbons? I think that's a very good question. That was the question I was asking myself and I just came. <laughs> what are the Gibbons? Well, just for anyone who doesn't know, they're endangered apes that are mostly found uh, in South Asia and Southeast Asia, mostly. Uh, steps for success. I think when I came here, uh, the very first time I was engaged into this program was through a hike. And even that hike, I've never hiked before. So I think it was, everything was too new to me. <laughs> so yeah, I, I hiked, but that hike had a special meaning to me. I was doing it for a reason. And that was just to go to a release site in a neighboring rainforest just next to school and to be able to release the gibbons that uh that are ready to be released so uh i think one step for success i think is to just look around you look what's happening be aware of what's happening and understand the meaning of your actions just every single thing that you do link it to your passions and if you find that you're passionate about it then follow up keep attached to it and i'm sure that a lot of things are good uh yeah i think if if i had to talk about the gibbons i at the start they were just like i said endangered apes but then i started understanding them more and the more i understood the gibbons their behavior the way they acted why some gibbons were different than others their sounds uh while i was cleaning cages uh how they were moving around uh disinfecting the cages sweeping the floors I think all of these steps, I think sometimes we tend to underestimate the impact of our actions. And what's so special about this project is that it's not a direct service, but it's more like through helping the people that are already making the impact. And that's helping the people that are working there in the center. And I think uh, it was just through that because normally like you have other service projects, which are also very good, like body dogs. And uh, that's, that's like what people. Actually, that's uh, sorry. <laughs> that it's okay. Carry on, Iman. If if anybody has got their microphones on, yeah. uh, please just uh, turn them off just while Iman's talking. Thank you. Sorry, Iman. Yeah, and I think it's uh, like I was talking about body dogs, and we're like mm -hmm. there is a very close contact to the animals, and that really uh, I would say uh, sparks this compassion. Uh, this compassion for the animals that you're taking care of but i think for the gibbons you shouldn't get close to them that's the special thing is that the whole aim of the program is to actually reduce human contacts and to give them back their wildlife and i think yeah thank you thank you Iman. i i know that i have very fond memories of you literally you arrived in school i think was it november on a Wednesday and on the Saturday, you were already hiking up the mountain and being involved. So yeah, just tremendous effort. Um, I think all of you have had some challenges um, that have made you stronger or more confident leaders. Would anybody like to talk about some of those monumentous uh, uh, challenges you face or the mountains that you had to climb in order to get to that success? Any challenges there? Uh, Gacto, Diego, in, in your programs? Um, I think that one of the big challenges to face for a 24 hour race was one, first acknowledging that a lot of our students are on scholarship, which means that financially it would be harder for them to support the 24 hour race, but also 
having to deal with the, well, obviously the expenses of having the race. And in previous years, when we were kind of, when the school was kind of hosting like weirdly unofficial 24 hour races, Tanya Pura and the school had a better agreement. However, due to like changes in management and the, through the meetings, we realized that it was quite expensive to have the race, especially in Tanya Pura track, obviously for 24 hours, uh, for more than 24 hours, because that's how long we did get it. But I think that like that challenge of, we want people to join, we can't make the tickets too expensive, but we need to make the tickets a certain amount to reach the goal and to break even. If um, I think that that challenge was really hard to overcome and it took us really close to the end and we tried to do like an early bird ticket, which was successful. Like a proportion, a large proportion of the people that participated went through the early bird ticket. But then even then we were worried that we wouldn't make it to break even. Mm -hmm. But I think that especially in this community for service projects, there's just a large amount of passion and compassion that goes into these service projects, be it from the people organizing or the people participating that helped us relieve our worries because more than a hundred people ended up joining and we went way past break even. Yeah. It was yeah. very successful. Yeah, and I think the way we had organized our team itself was what helped us overcome these challenges we faced during the time. So Diego and I were co-executive directors who looked over the entire event. And then we had two leaders for operations, business, community. And I feel like this system we had in place helped us overcome these challenges as we could delegate tasks so people could focus on specific issues and then we can come back together we always had a meeting once a week and towards the closer to the race it was twice a week so i feel like even though we did face these challenges our team was strong enough to overcome them by the end which i think was really good yeah uwc fosters an environment for such passionate people to work on all of these events and and like service projects so that definitely adds to the success yeah Oh, I've just got goosebumps. You guys are so gorgeous. <laughs> um, I just saw a hand up. Was that um, Kirsten or Kristen? Yeah, yes. that was Kirsten. Did you have a question, Kirsten? Yeah. Yep. Well, in general, I wanted to say it's really great to hear about all the projects that you've spoken about so far. And I, you, it clearly comes across how passionate you are about it. I just wanted to point out that the chat is disabled. So maybe that's why there's no questions popping up. Maybe it's only enabled for UWC email addresses at the moment. Sorry, okay, but it, okay. it's really wonderful <laughs> to hear what you're saying so far. And I'm sad that my son is only four years old when he will join the school because, you know, it will take some some uh, some years for him to become a, a true leader like you guys already are. So oh, I, I have to disagree. You know, we, <laughs> we actually have service programs, you know, embedded in every grade level, which, you know, I talked about earlier, where it was all scaffolded from one grade to the next. You know, one of the very early um, service aspects that or component students learn is about, you know, their role in the community, sharing and communicating within. So I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at the, the early programs our students are, are naturally doing in their, their grades. And that as they go from grade to grade, you know, it becomes um, more complex, more challenging, you know, more responsibility. Um, you know, so yes, we are only focusing today on the fabulous work the grade 11 and 12s are doing, but, you know, I, we could do another workshop for some of the inspiring things our younger students have done, but, uh, you know, selfishly, I want to showcase the, the lovely grade 11 and 12s because uh, the grade 12s are graduating very soon and uh, I don't have much more time with them, so. Um, Talking about challenges, um, I know that for many of us, we've really faced hardship and difficult times during COVID. You know, online teaching has um, been a challenge for, for all of us, whether you're on the receiving end or, or even on the delivery. And often um, the programs like Service and Outdoor Ed often get hit really, really hard. Um, would anybody like to share what they've been doing or during times of COVID, during times of lockdown or isolation, how they, oh God, Zuleika, that was really quick. It was like quick. <laughs> um, yeah, so Zuleika, go straight into it. Would you like to share, you know, one of your experiences from being online and how you've had, maybe had a successful service project? Yeah, so hi, my name is Zuleika. I'm from Malaysia and I spent the first quarter of IB 
online and so did like a lot of people who did transfer from uh, UWC Japan to UWC Thailand and through that um, it was a long waiting game so we learned how to we just made that the new norm of our lifestyle and um, the project that I led was Kwaka Quotes where our aim was to overcome tabooness of mental illnesses and we did that through um, making a children's book. And over one month, we were able to research, um, plan, design, and eventually working on publishing our book. Um, and I think our largest challenge obviously was being online. But I think for me, I felt that a large issue in our group at the beginning was that none of us knew each other and we were all in different countries with different time zones. So we all had to think in one time zone and accommodate for everybody and be mindful of that. Some people were waking up at three in the morning just to go for the normal classes. And it wasn't always reasonable to make people attend meetings at the end of the school day. And that could have been like seven in the morning with some people. So I think the challenge that we were able to work our way around eventually, but was something that was almost completely out of our control was um yeah not being physically together but still proud of the outcome thank you Zuleika and having looked at that, that um the book that you've made about Andy and his friends um it's very very powerful um and yeah really special so really excited to see if there's a a second book or a third book you know in, in the series so watch out for that. Um, so a lot of you have talked about um, who supported you along the way and the systems that are in place to support you. Um, because obviously, behind every success, you know, there's processes and proposals, etc. Um, does anybody want to talk about? Um, yeah, what are the processes? What are the systems behind? And who, who is there to support you? Um, to, to navigate you, you know, through that, through that journey. And if I think about um, you know, particularly um, some of the stuff that you've done outside of school. Oh, Richard, Joseph, you've got your hands up. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Richard. I'm from Liberia. And I'm Joseph. I'm from Indonesia. So um, we're both co-leaders of the Mirror Foundation SIT trip this month. Um, to answer to Heidi's question, one thing that I feel like we fail to notice coming to UWC is that we're a community. Um, it will probably be like everyone's focus on how hard the IB is or like just missing family and missing home. That we forget to see that there's like a long chain of people here ready to help and willing to help. And all we have to do is just take that responsibility to ask for the help. Um, for a trip outside of school, we have like obviously to Heidi, um, she's there to help. She's there to help with like the budgeting. As long as you know what you're doing and she's convinced that you're able to lead this trip, she's always ready to help you. Um, through Jason, he helps us with like the first aid and Rick's assessment. So he usually like talks to us, have discussions about like Rick's that are on the trip and how you're gonna be able to like prevent these Rick's and take like preventive measures. We have Primok. I love Primok so much. Um, she's really helpful. She helps us a lot in like booking transportation and reservation. And like these small people, like these small like characters in our like adventure, they just help us to make successful. Like they're just there to support. Uh, just adding from Richard, we went to what is a uh, SID trip. So SID trip is basically like uh, the trip that is uh, initiated by students. So the school support you uh, to have a trip. And the trip is basically like, we go to somewhere in Thailand and we do our service there. So uh, to answer Kuhaydi's question, like who do you have to help and support you? I think it's like having the important, uh, the important thing is that having the Thai speaker in your team uh, is the uh, important thing because uh, your destination is somewhere like, okay, probably it's in Phuket. There are a lot of people that can speak English, but in for specifically in our uh, destination, it was in Chiang Rai. 
which is there are no uh, one that can speak English. So that's why I think that's the important thing. And I also want to talk about uh, how to be super organized, which is like uh, the thing in here, the thing is important is that how you manage your team, uh, how you divide your works throughout your team so that every person in your team have their own work to do. Uh, that's why we can like, you know, help each other and we can come up as a team. Thank you, Richard and Joseph. So this common themes there, that collaboration, having that support group, um, planning, 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 planning. And it sounds like, you know, all of you are doing such good planning that you're almost, you know, anticipating any of the problems that you might, might, um, might encounter. And obviously, you know, doing the risk assessments with, with Crew Jason, as, as you mentioned, you know, alleviates or reduces any of those sort of risks that, um, again, you might might face, especially off campus, when you may not have that support system immediately around you. So, yeah, thank you, Richard and, and Joseph, for sharing that. Um, here's, a, here's a question for you. A lot of you have yeah. just been talking about external um, uh, projects, etc. Uh, yeah, external projects and partners that you've been working with. But sometimes our bit, biggest critics are our peers, you know, working alongside our peers. Um, last week, uh, we had the conflict resolution um, uh, seminar. So I know that we've got um, Samarat and Ismail who were part of that program. How is it presenting and running a program actually for your peers when most of our students have actually been talking about experiences with external partners and projects? So can you give us a little highlight or just a little synopsis of how that journey was? Um, so one thing that's important to know is that the Conflict Transformation Seminar falls into a bigger Conflict Transformation Week. And how we work with, it, with our peers was one of the biggest learning outcomes from this event for me because we kind of came with an idea and quickly realized that we had to be flexible and we had to take criticism because at the end, the program was being run for our peers rather than for what we had in mind only. So what was, I think this ended up being for the better because when we actually keep flexibility and learn from our peers, we end up with the best version of the event that could have ever happened. And I feel like this applies to most activities that are being planned. And at the end, yes, this fell into a perfect place and a perfect time with the current event happening in the world right now. Because one, when we listen to our peers and when we take criticism, we can adapt it to be more relevant to the current geopolitical solution, situation and just social situations in our community. So although peer criticism can be harsh to take sometimes, I think it's one of our best assets and one of our best tools for evolution. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, yeah, and just adding on to what Ismail is saying, um, the UWC talks with happened on, on Friday, which was like one of the core events of the whole Conflict Transformation Week. Um, I think it was so good to learn from our peers and learn the insights on global conflicts, communal conflicts, and personal conflicts. And overall, it was such a nice feeling to get after the event that we were able to give a platform to our peers to express themselves. And in that process, we do acknowledge the fact that at times, there were times where, where we were a bit on less on time or we were getting some sort of constructive feedback from our peers, which eventually led us to organize such a wonderful event. So I think constructive criticism and constructive feedback from our peers is really important for any event to be really successful and in that process uh, we get to learn a lot of things as well so i think just adding on to what ismail said i think that is one of our biggest assets and also my name is samarth and i'm from nepal yeah. i forgot to introduce yeah. myself <laughs> likewise my name is ismail i'm from Mark. heidi you're muted Whoopsie. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ishmael and um, Samarat, you know, for being very open about that, because taking on board criticism from, from your peers, you know, can be a big, big challenge. It's, you know, you did a phenomenal job last Friday. So, you yeah, know, very empowering. 
Um, I do have one more question to ask, but I would like to see if there's any questions, you know, out there. Anybody got any questions for our amazing students? We had a um, question come up in the chat, Heidi. Yeah. Um, are there any examples, and maybe this could come from any students who are yeah. direct entry students and so they've been in UWC Thailand for a few years, or maybe from you, Crew Heidi, are there any examples the group might be able to provide of service learning or, or projects that younger students take part in? So I missed the latter part. Was, did you say younger students? Yeah, so for younger students, we've got on the call for us here, grade 11 and grade 12 students for those yeah. who didn't hear that initial part. So are there projects that any of our students maybe here uh, participated in when they were younger or for you, Crew Heidi, as the service coordinator, can you give some examples of uh, projects for younger students? Yeah, well, I'll turn it straight over to Annika, um, Gio and Jay Bryan. Um, you are students who've been, oh, and Gacto, sorry, been here for a few more years. So do you want to share any of the service projects you, you did in the younger grades? And we, none of you were here in PYP, so I can give some examples. I can start by saying something. Um, so hi, I'm, I'm my name's Dr. Dan from Japan, and I've been at UWC Thailand since grade 10. And sorry, Gacto, can you speak up a little bit? Sorry. <laughs> Um, so, I've been at this school since grade 10, and one of the things that I remember from last year's service learning is that uh, grade 10 students will get in small groups, and we will plan a CCA activity that we can provide for primary students. So, what we were doing is that we were coming up with activities that aligned with our school mission, so which and in my group, we did something that was aligned to good health and well, uh, balanced, balanced mind, I think. And then, so it was all basically fostering students' creativity and ability to work with others while being responsible and to support and provide enjoyable experiences for primary kids who are still young so that's something that I remember from service learning. Thank you, Geto. So that was part of the experiential learning course that we do from grade six to 10. And the grade 10s actually have to plan and lead a, a co-curricular activity um, for, the, for the primary years. Um, Gio, Jay, Brian, um, Annika, anything that you, you did in your middle years program that you can remember? Um, so when I was in grade 10 and nine, um, we had 24 hour races unofficially here and the teams who did them, then they're always willing to have people help and bring in new ideas. So you can always, even if you're not officially part of a service program, that's all, they're always welcoming help and new ideas and new perspectives. That's something I remember being a big part of, because when you're younger, you don't sometimes see the full picture of the whole event and it might seem overwhelming to run an event that at such a young age but being able to help out with the older kids and develop skills during MYP which then you can take and then you build a bond with those people who run those events and then once you get to the position we are in you already know what it takes to take over the event and run it yourself and make it a legacy event that goes throughout the school for years to come so I'd say that's what younger generations in MYP can do and what I did. So no, unfortunately, none of our students here were present in, in the primary school. Um, but to give you some examples, we've got what's called the Manta Guardians. Um, so it, that's the, um, the junior version of our Manta program that we have in, in the MYP and the diploma, um, whereby, again, they're looking at environmental issues around uh, Phuket, uh, particularly mangrove planting is something that they concentrate on. Um, we've got younger students who participate um, with our older students on a Saturday morning at Bodhi Dogs, which is a dog refuge centre. Um, we've got Plastic Free Phuket, although be um, a grade 11 and well, grade 11 initiative and um, focusing very much on plastic use and beach cleanups in our area. Um, again, that is open up to all of our um, age grades. And I think we've got, um, yeah, Gacto, who's in charge now of what's called the five star life bag packing, um, which is, uh, well, Gacto, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because you have primary school students working alongside you in that. Yes. Um, so 
to give a little more details about five star marine guard pack packing is that we on Saturday 10 a.m. we invite all students, all staff members, all all parents at EWC Thailand to join us right now because of COVID restrictions. So right now uh, in the math room in secondary school building. And we on a weekly basis pack about 300 bags to give out to the local community who needs to help. So it's this service project is in conjunction with the local uh, tourism company, which is um, Five Star Marine. And this, this project is heavily um, supported by Mr. Stang, um, Sean from Five Star. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of the project that I'm doing. Yeah. So we do have a number of um, service-based projects in each um, PYP, MYP and the diploma, but I think more importantly, we do have those programs that really encourage primary and secondary school students to, to interact with each other. And I think that role modeling is really important for our younger students to see you know, how the older students are, are planning and developing programs and implementing them um, for them to, to witness it firsthand. And I'm sure that the, the senior students actually get a lot from interactions with the primary. Um, so we have a great question in the yeah. chat, Heidi, if I can jump in. Yes, please do. Um, really excellent question about uh, potential changing of your mind. So for students out there and anyone who yeah. wants to maybe pop in and, and answer, we'd be happy to hear from you. Have any of these amazing experiences made you change your mind about what you might want to study or pursue career-wise? after high school or even after university. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Uh, so I, from a young age, I knew I wanted to go into the medicine field, especially um, sports medicine. However, by organizing the 24 hours, I deepened my knowledge on the issue of human slavery and sex trafficking and policies in place around the world in Thailand that affect that to prolong this issue. And in DP, I take global politics as well as a subject. So by organizing this event, it also made me look into the field of international relations, a uh, field that I could make change in the future. So it was something that didn't, it, it didn't change my mind completely, but it made me want to look into it more and as a possible to do as well alongside medicine. So I would say that's something that happened to me personally. Uh, yeah, and for me, I believe, so what I always want to do is somewhere in the STEM field and sciences and stuff and, you know, running a cafe isn't really connected to that, but I think uh, being able to lead something like this gives me a very like invaluable experience for my future, like working conditions and like working in a job. And for example, in university where, you know, I might need some extra, you know, money around, you know, I can work in a couple of different places and restaurants and having that experience of being part of a you know small business and running a, a cafe like that can really help me in you know in being able to understand the different things that need to be done when running something like that yeah. I think just highlighting on or picking up on that one Jay Brian I'll come back to you in a moment Ivan um, just for point of reference for many people out there um, when you probably went to high school, you were able to do part-time or have a part-time job. Unfortunately, our students who are on student visas here in Thailand cannot do that. So any opportunities to promote some of the skill set within their personal resume here at school is, is vitally important for them because they don't necessarily get that work-based work experience that many of us did growing up to get pocket money. So Ayman, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, so for my case, uh, I, I would say what I wanted to do, in fact, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do <laughs> and I still don't know what I want to do, but I'm sure that I got closer to the field I'm passionate about. And to be talking about that, uh, I would say here for the given rehabilitation program, it's that we're in Thailand and uh, the government wasn't really uh, financially uh, helping the project and wasn't making it easy for the project to rise and to get as many funds as someone can imagine. So I think just by looking at this, then I started developing something for um, a field in which I can 
be present when I'm making the change and be close to the people I'm making the change for. So I was thinking about public policy and, and that's how I think I was getting closer to this field. And I think, yeah, I, I think it's just by, as I mentioned before, one step of success to just be aware, increase your awareness of what's around you. And I think that's what made me get closer to the field. I may be passionate about it because I'm still unsure of what I want to do. <laughs> I've always been unsure. <laughs> Ismail? Um, very similar to Anka, before coming to this school, I was set on studying medicine and I kind of had my whole life planned out for the following 15 years. <laughs> but um, just my experiences with diversity, equity, inclusion, and all the leadership projects that I've had the chance to participate in have kind of redirected me towards just making attention to the importance of diversity in the world and how it's so crucial to infuse every single activity that we do with diversity. And I feel like the intersection between health, diversity, and all of that would be anthropology for me. And we're also very lucky that this school does hold an anthropology program and an anthropology extracurricular activity. So although this might not have changed what I want to do professionally, I think that this school really gives us an opportunity to infuse our professional wishes with our passions just by keeping an open mind and learning from our leadership. Zizi? Yeah, I just wanted to add on. Um, I kind of had the similar um, thinking as like Ismail and Jay Bryan had mentioned where I've been mostly set to do like STEM in the future and like in my past, I've had most exposure to STEM subjects, but then after moving to UWC, I noticed that like other people were interested in like humanity subjects and sociology, and I wanted to be more involved and expose myself to that option. And I did that through like um, starting this project. And even though I'm still keen on doing STEM in the future, I think that even just having the opportunity to be around people who are more driven towards going to a field that is related to English just helps you realize what you do prefer to do, what you would prefer to do in the future compared to not, which I think is important, especially which comes with being in like an international school and like surrounded by people who come from very different backgrounds. I love that you're pointing out that sometimes uh, when you try new things, it, it shows you what you don't want to do. <laughs> I think those are always very valuable experiences. I have done that and I don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> so there's a really great question in the chat about uh, service work and connection with cultural sensitivity. Uh, the person coming in is from Australia and wondering, is this a challenge that you have faced? And if so, I'm curious how you might have addressed that challenge. So uh, recently, I have taken the chair of the head of student diversity at our school. And uh, with the conflict transformation week among others, I've realized that those issues of identity, resolving conflicts, building peace, do not look the same all around the world. And especially at our school that is so diverse and that holds so many different nationalities and ethnicities, it's of utmost importance to always keep in mind cultural sensitivity and cultural reflection because what might work for example for conflict transformation for someone might not work for another person so i feel like it's not just something that is cool to have in a project it's something that needs to be addressed and it's something that needs to be given crucial focus for a subject to actually happen and actually be meaningful that's a great reflection ismail thank you adafru did you have a question for our panelists Thank you uh, for the moderators. I'm Adafro Adana from Ethiopia. So it's, it's really a pleasure to share such ideas from uh, diverse individuals, particularly the youngsters there. So I really, really, I have just uh, got a thought uh, with regard to the responsibilities that uh, we need to cultivate in our uh, youngsters. 
By the way, I'm the educator in a university here. But in Ethiopia, <clears throat> we, we, we totally lack such experience. So maybe I am in the area of education. So this is just a pleasure to share such ideas with you all. So I would like to say thank you. Uh, so I have no question, but uh, just to say something as a comment, this is just uh, a good opportunity for me to share such experiences. So thank you again. Oh, thank you so much for that. Actually, that connects quite well with one of the questions that we've gotten into the chat, which is um, just this idea of starting out. So if you're in an area where maybe service is not present, it's not part of uh, you know the, the entity that you're currently in, any recommendation on how we might start out getting service going in the context that we're in? This might be for students or for crew Heidi to address. There, with regard to our country here, yeah, maybe wonderful. I'm not clear with your issue, with the question, but that's uh, what I can just uh, thinking of is, here in education or in the curriculum, we need to think of the extracurricular activities. Uh, just beyond the classroom teaching learning process, such types of activities are just uh, so important in order to uh, cultivate the young or the citizens with a responsibility for themselves as well as for their community because learning uh, is not all about the classroom activities. I believe in that. So uh, maybe uh, this is just an, an input for me. Uh, just in my career also, it can just contribute a lot. Yeah, that's a great takeaway. And I, and I heard crew Heidi say that as well as she was talking, how important it is to dedicate time and resources to what we hope to see. Is Mylin Samarth, did you want to add in there? Um, yeah, just to add on a bit um, on what um, our speaker said. Um, yeah, I think in a community where service is not um, normal or is not very common, I think just um, forming a very good team and working with a group of people so you are not alone is something that, that could be very powerful because in a community when something is very new, um, obviously we, if we have a very strong team and a team that actually reflects our, our beliefs and passion to a lot of people, then that also helps to change the minds of other people who don't really know about that, that thing. So having a very, very nice team and working together, I think that is really important. Like for me, from my culture in Nepal, um, that's the same thing. Like we don't have a lot of service projects, especially led by students. So students being connected with each other and, and being with each other um, and working very closely, I think that is very powerful and empowering for everyone in the team. And I think as an educator, um, my last three schools actually have had very powerful vision and values. And it was very easy to start breaking down who we are as a school and start identifying the difference we want to make within our community. I then look within that community to see how those partnerships can be created and take some time to, to make those connections because it's not going to happen overnight. And, you know, you are going to have to spend a lot of time um, yeah, working together to make sure that, you know, the, the relationship is reciprocal. So. Well, we wish you very well in, in Ethiopia. We'll hope that maybe you'll be holding a webinar soon to tell us all about the amazing service projects that you're able to achieve there. As we close out the hour, respectful of your time, I really would love to give a resounding round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much, yeah. students for Thank joining you. us with all of your amazing projects and for everything you do for UWC Thailand and for the broader Phuket in Thailand community. And what's interesting about UWC Thailand students, right, is that you, you eventually leave us, though we don't want to let you go. You do go on in life, and then it's always very exciting to see what you do moving forward. So really grateful for all of the positive comments in the chat and to, to see that those present on the webinar today are really appreciating how fantastic our students are as much as we all appreciate each and every day. So we'll be closing our webinar today with much appreciation for Crew Heidi and for our students who've joined us. So thank you all so much. <laughs>